Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a big crowd. Uh, Owen Jones was meant to be the chair tonight, but thanks to a diary mix-up, he's not here. I am Owen Jones's stand-in, a phrase that ordinarily would cause me great hurt, but I'm OK with it. Uh, my name is John Harris. I write for The Guardian. I make films for The Guardian as well. Most of the time, if not all the time at the moment, uh, they're about Brexit. That's my life, really, at the moment. Even on a Friday fucking night. <laughs> um, the title of this event, as you all know, is Brexit and an Orthodox View. And by normal British standards, or contemporary British standards, um, this conversation, I guess, is going to be unorthodox in two ways. I think it's fair to say that the national conversation about Brexit, right, left, and center, tends to be quite parochial. Um, certainly in line with the kind of uh, British exceptionalism that sat at the heart of the Leave campaign, people are encouraged to believe by rival newspapers, ho, 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 uh, that Brexit is somehow a uniquely British event down to uniquely British factors with a uniquely British story running under it. Clearly, that isn't true. It reflects economic, social, and political tensions that are happening all across Europe. Paradoxically, Brexit is a deeply European story, and the conversation tonight will reflect that. Um, I think, uh, as well as that, on the left, there is a kind of dejection, a very understandable dejection, which um, a lot of us feel. I'll ask later whether we've got any Leave voters in. It's always an interesting question. Maybe one or two. Uh, on the left, there's a dejection about it, I think. In certain quarters, maybe a resignation. Certainly, resignation's in the Labour Party at the moment. Um, <laughs> hopefully, for at least some of this conversation, we're going to be talking in slightly more optimistic, positive, proactive, forward-thinking terms. Talk, we're going to talk about what to do, about the situation we find ourselves in, what to do, really, to take politics in a very different direction from where it's headed at the moment, which clearly causes a lot of us a great deal of worry and concern and anger. Tonight reflects the progress of a campaign, a movement that most of you I, I'm sure will have heard of, DM25, the Democracy in Europe Movement 2025, which aims at a radically different vision, version of the EU and of Europe. They're hosting a big grassroots event in London tomorrow, which is happening at a famous location of sedition and creative thinking, the Conway Hall, where I think the Sex Pistols played once. <laughs> Uh, that starts at 10 a.m., and it's, uh, if you rock up there, I think you'll be allowed in within reason. So the conversation, I think, will hint at some of that and look ahead to what's going on tomorrow. The plan really is for me to talk uh, uh, to the panellists for maybe 45 minutes or an hour or so, and then because the venue is so big, we're not able to take questions from the floor, but people who I think are here have sent in questions in advance, so we will then tackle the questions that they have sent in. I'm going to introduce you to the panel now. Books by each of whom are available in the foyer. That's actually true. Um, over on uh, my far left, perhaps suitably, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, you all know him. He's an economist, writer, politician, the former Greek finance minister, the author of, author of several books, the latest of which, which I've just completed reading, is an absolute must read. It's called And the Weak Suffer What They Must. Europe's crisis and America's economic future. That's Yanis Varoufakis, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Next to him is Elif Shafak. She's a, a Turkish author and writer with a beautiful serendipity. She was born in Strasbourg. <laughs> she was then raised in Madrid. Uh, she's lived all over the world. She now splits her time between London and Istanbul. Of Brexit, she recently wrote, it will have far-reaching ripple effects, more populism, more jingoism. Paradoxically, the art of storytelling will be even more important from now on. That's Elif Shafak. Next to me is Srećko Horvat, who's a philosopher, writer, political activist. He was born in Croatia. It's a common theme emerging here. I should <laughs> mention, incidentally, that Yanis was telling me earlier on that he saw the Sex Pistols play in 1977, so he's been around the European bloc as well. Srećko was born in Croatia. He spent the first eight years of his life in Germany. He's now regarded as one of the key voices of the new left in the former Yugoslavia. 
He's the author or co-author uh, of uh, Welcome to the Desert of Post-Socialism. That's you alone, is that right? Yes. No, with Igor Stix, That's another Balkan guy. <laughs> subtitled Radical Politics After Yugoslavia and the co-author with the great Slavoj Žižek of What Does Europe Want? The Union and Its Discontents, which is essentially the question we're going to be discussing this evening. That's Sreczko Horvat. So let's start with Sreczko and go in that direction. Sreczko, tell me, for, tell us for five minutes about Brexit Europe, perhaps in the, in the context of the country you call home. Yeah, well, good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with Yanis and with Elif and with you. Uh, first of all, I have to give a correction. Uh, I was born in Croatia, but uh, it was part of a country, of a state which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it is Yugoslavia. And, uh, well, in this introductory note, I want to speak uh, precisely from the perspective of Yugoslavia and the collapse of Yugoslavia, which I think might be a very good lesson for the collapse of the European Union, which, in my opinion, is coming very soon. And uh, Brexit is uh, just one of the symptoms uh, in that direction. Uh, so what are the commonalities? What, what is the analogy between the collapse of Yugoslavia and the possible collapse uh, of the European Union? First of all, both European Union and Yugoslavia were formed as peace projects. They came out of the Second World War and similar to the European Union, where at least on paper they wanted to prevent war between uh, France, Germany and then other European countries. Uh, Yugoslavia was born out of the big anti-fascist partisan movement. Also one of your guys, Fitzroy McLean, came there because Churchill sent him to kill more Nazis than the partisans killed already. Uh, so thanks to Churchill and Fitzroy McLean for helping us. Uh, and well, Yugoslavia started also as a peace project uh, and it prevented until the collapse of Yugoslavia war between the Croats, between the Serbs, between the Muslim Bosnians and so on. Uh, this is the first analogy. The second analogy, and here we come to more interesting stuff, is that already in Yugoslavia uh, we had something uh, uh, which is now one of the biggest problems of the European Union, which is the difference between the center and the periphery. Uh, so at the very beginning of, of this project, of the Yugoslav project, uh, for instance, Slovenia was three times more developed than Kosovo. And then in 1989, just before the collapse of Yugoslavia, Slovenia was eight times more developed than Kosovo. Uh, it was a very similar situation between the periphery and the center. The surplus value was going to the center. Uh, people from Kosovo and from Bosnia were considered gastarbeiters uh, who worked in Slovenia. Uh, and, well, this is one of the other commonalities. There's also another commonality, which is uh, the fact that the problems which started on the periphery, uh, which is, on the one hand, nationalism, on the other hand, labor reforms, very soon came to the, to the center, which is Serbia and Croatia mainly, and Slovenia, uh, which is something what is happening now in Europe as well. You have seen what is happening in Greece. You had first uh, the rise of the extreme right-wing party, Golden Dawn. And then what we can face today in Europe is that you have the rise of extreme uh, right-wing parties all over Europe or something what we might call the rise of the extreme center. The same with labor, labor reforms, as Yanis knows very well. Uh, what was being experimented in Greece with the labor reforms is now coming back to the center as a boomerang to the center of the European Union. It is enough, I just came from Paris, to, to, to look what Hollande's labor reforms tried to do. Um, on the other hand, the good part of Yugoslavia was, of course, of course multiculturalism. We had free, free religions, Christianity, Islam, and Orthodox. Uh, we had several languages, although in my opinion it's one, one and the same language, but we can discuss this later. And of course, the same as the European Union, we had stereotypes. So, as today in the European Union, uh, Germans are considered the ones who work the most, although the statistics show the opposite. And Greeks, uh, no, really, Yanis can talk about it later <laughs> as well. Uh, I will leave all the economics and statistics to Yanis so I can speak about philosophy and give some dirty jokes. Uh, <laughs> and the dirty, jokes is, dirty joke is coming. So the Greeks were considered to be lazy, and you had a very similar situation in Yugoslavia. The Slovenians, the Croats were considered to be the hard workers, and the Montenegrin people were considered to be lazy. So there is, a, I'm warning you, I'm sorry for, for my French, 
Uh, there is a dirty joke about the Montenegrins. Uh, do you know how the Montenegrin masturbates? He digs up a hole in the earth and he waits for an earthquake. <laughs> because they are considered to be so lazy, you know. But well, so as you can see, we had, you know, we had the same problems, uh, uh, but to come because uh, I think I have only two minutes left, um, I think what is important to say, and I think this is the most important jokes aside, the most important lesson of the collapse of Yugoslavia is the following one. Usually it's regarded, and that, that's why I think this book which you mentioned uh, is important because it gives another perspective on the collapse of Yugoslavia. Welcome to the, po to the desert of post-socialism. Usually it's considered that Yugoslavia collapsed because of nationalism. But I think it's time to turn it upside down precisely because it's a good lesson for the potential collapse of the European Union. My thesis, and not only my thesis, but some scholars who are dealing with Yugoslavia now, is that actually nationalism was a consequence of the disintegration of Yugoslavia, which already happened. In what sense? Uh, in the 80s, uh, this is not really known, and I'm really glad to talk about it in front of uh, a British audience. Uh, Yugoslavia from 79 to 88 took six standby arrangements, loans from the International Monetary Fund. The first one was taken when Tito was still alive. The second one in May 1980 when Tito died. And it is considered to be the biggest loan the IMF gave to a country to that date. Why is that important? It is important because at that time austerity measures were imposed. Uh, the deindustrialization was imposed. The process of so-called transition from real existing socialism to capitalism, which includes privatization, mass unemployment, also started. And what you can follow then, and here I'm finishing, because, and I think this is the most important lesson for Britain, for Trump, and what we are facing with the upcoming elections in Holland, in France, and in Germany this year. In the 80s, uh, there were 200 worker strikes in Croatia with 12,000 people involved. You can say that's nothing. Already the next year, the number is double. The next year, the number is double. In 87, which is the year of the sixth loan of the IMF, you have more than 1,700 worker strikes and 300,000 people involved. So imagine this situation in Britain or in the European Union today, that you have almost 2,000 worker strikes happening on an annual basis. So what you can see here, and here we come to Trump as well, because a guy who was a former banker returns from, from, from the US, and he turns, and I'm finishing, this is an important point because it brings us directly to the future, to Trump, and also to Farage and the other guys. Uh, a guy comes back, and this guy was a former banker, he's called Slobodan Milosevic, and he turns all these worker strikes where Bosnian people, Muslims, Orthodox people, Serbs, Croats were fighting together against austerity measures, and he turns it into happenings of the people. And to finish with it, I think the category of the people today, you have seen Trump's inaugurational speech, is the most important uh, category today, and what we have to speak today is precisely about the working class, especially in the, in the context of Britain. This was very short, we can continue in the, in the discussion. Thank you. Srechko. In some ways, history re repeats itself in different ways, over and over again. Elif, from your perspective, Turkey is your home country, a, a, a country which in the worst possible way loomed large in the so-called debate around Brexit. Tell me about Brexit from your perspective. Yes, as a, as a Turkish writer, I'm very used to uh, defending the EU against nationalists and isolationists in Turkey. For many years, I've, um, I had to do that. But to be honest, I would have never thought that there would come a day uh, when I would have to defend the EU here in the, in the United Kingdom or across the, across the continent, across the European continent. Many people don't seem to understand that the EU is not only about getting the best trade deals. I think it's also about shared ideals, shared values, and it is about shared memory, the memory of a past that's so turbulent and so recent that its ghosts are still with us. You know, they have, they're still here. I think the Turkish case is, is in very important. As a country, it's very complicated, it's very multi-layered, and many times it has been regarded as a buffer zone between uh, the Middle East and the Balkans, and recently, of course, between the Syrian war and the, and the European shores. 
It's worth taking a very close look at Turkey's trajectory because it holds incredibly important lessons for all of us uh, around the world, but particularly in Europe. In other words, I think it's important to understand how liberals and democrats and secularists in Turkey have been defeated because that's how we feel today. We feel very abundant, we feel very forsaken. As you know, Turkey was a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious empire that lasted for more than 600 years. And then came the nation state. Um, one of the, the cement, the ideologies of the nation state was of course nationalism, the idea that we were all, all of us same. The story of Turkey's recent political history in some ways is the story of the loss of cosmopolitanism, the loss of diversity. And I have observed that this comes at a huge cost, and I'm not talking about a financial cost, but I think it, it, it's a cost that also leaves a big impact on our, on our souls, never to appreciate diversity, never to see cosmopolitanism uh, as, a, as a value in itself. But more recently, when we look at Turkey's, of course, dealings with the EU, this is a country that has been waiting in EU's waiting room for the longest time possible. Uh, and it's quite interesting because uh, among all the candidate states, it was in Turkey that the public enthusiasm for EU was the highest. Yeah? In 2004, it was more than 70%. People were eager, people were willing to be part of EU. Today, after so many years, after so many zigzags, that percentage has fallen dramatically. It's around like 20%. And of course, as you know, Turkey is going through a very turbulent time. It's a country that has witnessed in the last one and a half years over 35 terror attacks. So much is happening in Turkey so fast that, it, that there's barely any time to stop and digest and analyze. It feels as if the next week something else happens, then the next day something else happens. So time runs very fast in Turkey. But I think there are particular lessons in the Turkish case. The first is the fragility of democracy. Because we have had a party that came to power by using the means of democracy and then use its own power in order to suppress all the other voices within democracy. So this so-called pattern of illiberal democracy, which we also see in Hungary, in Poland, and which is a warning for many other countries in, across Europe, started in, in, in Turkey. Uh, democracy is a, is a very fragile system. And it's very easy to confuse it with majoritarianism. The Turkish case has also shown us that. You can have a ballot box, you can have the majority in free elections, but that in itself doesn't make a system a democracy. For a proper democracy to exist, you need other things. You need rule of law, separation of powers, you need women's rights, you need uh, LGBT rights. You definitely need a free, free and independent media. So without having all these things, what we ended up in Turkey with is majoritarianism rather than democracy. But in this journey, the relationship and the collapse of the relationship with EU has been incredibly important. Uh, and for that collapse, you will remember, there was almost a golden moment around 2005 when it seemed possible that Turkey was going to become a member of EU. And that golden moment, for me it was a golden moment, is it's gone, is lost. And I am criticizing the, the Turkish government for failing to fulfill the EU criteria, but I'm also criticizing, at the same time, populist politicians in Europe, particularly you will remember in France at the time, for using Turkey as a fear card in their elections. And this is a pattern that we have seen again and again, even with the Leave campaign during, uh, before the referendum and during the referendum. I never forget, uh, you know, driving by the, uh, uh, along the road and, and this big sign, you will remember it said, the Turks are coming, it's 80, 80 million of them, the Turks are coming, they're going to join the EU, so it's time for us to leave. So to, Turkey has always been used as, as the other in that regard. But what the populist politicians don't realize is, when Turkey was distanced from Europe, this directly worked to the benefit of the isolationists in Turkey. And who are they? The nationalists, the Islamists, and those who are more benefit from authoritarianism. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, isolationism never works 
uh, never, never contributes to democracy. We might be very critical of governments, but we must not push the societies away, the civil society away, because now we have these authoritarian elites telling to the Turkish youth, you see, Europe doesn't want you. Europe doesn't want you because you're Muslims, because this is a Christian club, and we have to join Shanghai Pact. And this is a very dangerous polarization. Just as a last comment, I am very concerned about uh, the, the, the surge in populism. I, I see lots of similarities. Turkey has been a prime example of this. But to be honest, and we will have time to talk about Trump too, to be honest, I'm more worried about populism and nationalism in this continent, in European continent, than in America. Because here, it has a longer and a much darker past. Just very briefly, there, was a, uh, there have been several researches, but the Pew uh, survey is very interesting. Uh, when asked what they thought about diversity, many citizens, in particularly five European countries, and I'm sorry, Yanis, Greece is among them. So there's Hungary, Poland, Greece, Netherlands, Italy. I'm very, more sorry than you are. Yes, absolutely. A very high percentage of citizens in this country say, because of diversity, my country became a worse place. And across the European continent, a third of Europeans said, diversity is not a good thing. So in conclusion, all I can say is, I come from a country that has lost its diversity, and I wouldn't want Europe to make the same mistake. Thank you, Alif. Yanis, in the course of the, uh, the referendum campaign, I would sometimes meet very zealous Remain people, the kind who drew the European stars on their face and all kinds of stuff. And I would say, maybe it's a bit more complicated than that, and the country that always came up first in those conversations at my behest really was Greece. So in this thing that you're saluting as this idyllic, perfect political institution, it may have downsides. Imagine if you were Greek. From your perspective, tell me about Brexit and how from, a, a, from the perspective of Greece and what's happened there in recent years? <laughs> well, just for the benefits of full disclosure, prior to the referendum in this country, I gave speeches in more than 10 cities here in, in Britain. And the DiEM line, our movement's line, is uh, in the EU against this EU. It was not a very easy message to sell, especially in Doncaster. And was, <laughs> but it was fun trying. <laughs> Very good people would come to me and say, look, we really like you. But why are you staying, asking us to stay in, the, you know, in this terrible EU? And I think, I agree with you that Greece is a very good um, source of insights. But allow me to tell my story about this by means of a tale that takes us to a different era, uh, which is consistent with uh, the format of what we're doing tonight, which is effectively, you know, you have a bunch of um, people from the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire and the Byzantine Empire coming to talk to you here in the center of London about Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Okay, once upon a time, there was this seafaring nation, proud seafaring nation, living under the thumb of a class system, a ruling class, that was intimately connected to a cosmopolitan global elite. This is Greece in the early 19th century, not Britain today. <laughs> and the result, of course, was nationalism and the Greek Revolution of 1821, which led to Elif and me not being citizens of the same state with the um, establishment of the modern Greek state, countless wars between Greece and Turkey, even more wars between Greeks, because we are very good at civil war. Um, like us. Like <laughs> Thank us. you. <laughs> and uh, it is very interesting to compare and contrast that experience of Greece then with Britain today. Because again, today, what you have in Britain is you have, especially the people 
in the rural areas of England, feeling that they live under the thumb of a ruling class which is intimately connected to a cosmopolitan elite which doesn't give a damn about them, treats them like discarded people, and nationalism is yet again the outcome. But there is a profound difference between the two periods. The 19th century was a period during which nationalism was essential for the evolution of capitalism. Without nationalism, there would have been no German reunification. There would have been uh, no rule of law that capital needs to accumulate and for mod modernity to come, to come into being. Uh, and of course, capital nationalism always comes attached with major human cost. The ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing began in the Balkans, in the former Ottoman Empire, as a result of nationalism. Yes. The creation of the nation state meant that the population, had, the population had to be cleansed. The Turks from Greeks had to be torn out and returned, returned. They ne had never been to what is today Turkey, mm -hmm. taken to Turkey. And the Greeks from the Asia Minor coast had to be pushed to Greece. Mm -hmm. So nationalism always comes up with, has costs. But at least back then, there was a historical process which one can associate with some progress. Liberalism, for instance, was also the result of the same process. Today, however, uh, you know, Nehru, remember, once said that this earlier phase of nationalism can be described by saying that nationalism is good in its place, back then it was, uh, but it is uh, an unreliable friend and unsafe historian. Well, today, nationalism is uh, profoundly more worrisome. And the reason is that the process of capital accumulation, what makes capitalism energetic, and I'm saying this as a left-winger who is extremely critical of capitalism, but nevertheless, when you live in capitalism and capitalism loses its energy, you end up with a depression, with deflationary forces, with all those elements which contributed to Brexit. Because I can't see my clock. You've got about two minutes. Okay. Uh, to take us Why did Brexit really happen? It's got nothing to do with the European Union. It happened because of two reasons. Involuntary underemployment in large parts of Britain, of England, which is the bitter price for austerity, and involuntary migration, both internal and from outside. People from the north of England do not come to London for the theatre scene. And Bulgarians do not come to Britain, or Greeks, or Portuguese, or Turks, because of the weather. <laughs> they come because they must, because there is a capitalist crisis, there is a crisis of European capitalism, which is creating the lowest level of investment in the history of the post-war era. In Britain, in Germany. You know, do you realize that what, what, just, you need, only need to state this to realize how serious th things are in Germany? Interest rates in Germany are negative. Do you know what this means? People pay the government to have their money. And the government is not using it to invest. And the private sector is not using it to invest. So investment is the lowest that it has ever been. The reason why we have such a low quality of jobs, such a low quality of social housing, of education, of health, is because of the lowest level of investment since 1945. And that, I'm afraid, is a little bit like climate change. It is not a problem that can be dealt with within Britain, within Germany, within France. In the same way that if we're going to be <coughs> successful in addressing climate change, we have to coordinate our actions along the lines of a progressive, from an ecological point of view, agenda. The same thing applies in the context of creating the circumstances that would allow people to live in Doncaster in dignity without having to migrate to London, people to live in Bulgaria, in Turkey, in Greece. In other words, we are in this together. It's a joint responsibility project. This is why we're saying, in this EU, against the establishment which is making the EU disintegrate with human costs all over the place. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to say that I'm from the north of England and I moved to London partly for the theatre scene. Can we just have... <laughs>
<laughs> that on the record. Um, there are some weird people who do that. <laughs> Granted. There is culture in the north. Um, the day after the referendum, the 24th, when I, I woke up and I cried, as Guardian writers are contractually obliged to do, <laughs> there was a certain ambivalence in, in my mind at the same time because I felt this was a reckoning. It was the wrong reckoning, it was an awful reckoning, but there was something righteous at the core of it, perhaps, that was inescapable as much as I was very saddened and frightened by it, which was that people who had been ignored for years and years and years mm -hmm had said, stop ignoring us. And that's what, they weren't the whole of the Brexit vote by any means, but that's what took it over the line. Stretchko, did you have any sort of similar feelings about that? Can you see what I mean when I talk about that? Yeah, well, I, I don't think it's a specific British problem. You can, you can see this uh, all over Europe. You can see it with Trump in the US. And as someone who is also a leftist, I have to say, it's a consequence of the failure of the left, of the liberals and the social democrats. Because it's precisely the left, the liberals and the social democrats who abandoned the working class and also the millennials and the young people. And I think it's our big task in the near future, because it might be too late if you think about the long future. And as Keynes said, in the long term, we are all anyhow dead. So it's, it's a task we have to do in the near future. How to approach the working class? I mean, these people here, all of us here, we belong to a specific class. We belong to frequent flyer activists class. Uh, some of you also come, go to theater or to concerts and so on. I go to punk hardcore core concerts as well. I don't listen so much classic music at Yanis. So we are a bit different, but still, I think the problem is, and I think that that's also one problem. I also travel around UK, so I went to Port Talbot to film a documentary for Al Jazeera about the problems of the European Union. And what I really despised uh, during all these, uh, you know, uh, Daily Sun uh, and all the big yellow papers in Britain speaking about Independence Day and so on, was the demonization of the working class. Yeah. So when I went to Port Talbot, I expected demons, vampires there, you know, people who are racist, who will kill me because I'm from, I'm from Croatia. And I sat down in a pub with them, and they were mentioning Keynes, you know, people who are workers, who are trade unionists. And you know, these people voted Brexit as well. So this is something interesting, and I think we have to analyze this, and I think the task for political activists is precisely to bring the working class back. But to, to finish, it's a failure of the left, go to France, as just came from France, look at the social democrats. How can Hollande be called a socialist if he's doing a labor reform which is an austerity labor, labor reform? You had that in Britain with the third wave with Blair as well. You have it all over. And unfortunately, some so-called radical left parties in Europe are also turning into social democrats. So I think this is the biggest task to anyone who wants to consider himself as a progressive. And what we are trying to do in DiEM is not only, you know, to, 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 to bring radical left uh, in, this, in this nest, but also to bring honest conservatives, if you want, social democrats, liberals, because what I think from my experience of Yugoslavia, uh, you know, when, when the siege of Sarajevo was happening, it was happening one hour away with a flight from Vienna, from Rome, from the, from the metropolis of Europe, and no one believed it could happen. Well, we had the longest siege of a city since the Second World War, which lasted more than three years. And I think something similar, because we are in the state of something what in psychoanalysis would be called fetishist disavowal, something similar could be happening in Europe already this year. And I would call it war. I mean, just to give one fact, one month ago, there was the biggest import of arms to Germany from the US, which is now being you know, dispersed in Poland and the Ukrainian Russian border since the collapse of the Berlin Wall. So I think this should scare us. And as Yanis said, ecological crisis, potential of war, yeah. refugee crisis, this is not something which can be handled on the national level. It can be only handled on the international level. I've been, I've been told to finish on an optimistic note. This is going to take some manoeuvring, I fear. But um... <laughs> I, I have an optimistic <laughs> OK, I'll come to you in a minute. Elif, Just one sentence. No, no, let me speak to Elif. Elif, uh, how did you feel about Brexit in its immediate aftermath? Mm -hmm. As somebody who's not from Britain, England, who lives here, did you feel different about the country the morning after the vote happened? You know, if we, if we take a step back and think about all the ev events, there's a chain of, of events that caught many journalists, scholars, foreign experts, international experts and, and economic experts by surprise. 
He will remember Arab Spring, how it started with a lot of optimism, what were the expectations and how quickly it turned into Arab winter. Yeah? He will remember how the financial crisis caught so many people uh, by, by surprise. Interestingly, the refugee crisis was also regarded by shock and surprise, even though it took years in the making. I mean, the Syrian war, it was boiling and brewing in front of our eyes, year after year, and there came a tipping point, and then we had the refugee crisis, but again, it took us by surprise. Then came Brexit, it wasn't expected by many people, many, many intellectual people, many educated people, then came Trump, again, it wasn't expected. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, Maybe there's something a little bit wrong with the way we approach things. Yeah, maybe we are all very much in our own little islands, in our own little mental ghettos, and we need to break these, these echo chambers that somehow do not communicate. Uh, I find it very important that we pay more attention to culture, not only to economy, because when you, when you look at the factors, for instance, in Poland, it became a big issue, immigration. Poland is not a country where there are lots of immigrants. We're talking about a country that has 97% white Catholic population. It's not like uh, immigrants are their number one problem, but it was a big, big issue in their national election what campaigns. What does that tell you? It does tell me that it's not only about the facts, it's also about the perceptions. It's also about people's feelings. It's also about people's emotions. And I am very well aware that emotion is a subject that is underestimated and belittled in mainstream political theory. But in general, we on the left, liberal, democrat, progressive circles, I don't think we have done a very good job in terms of connecting with people's emotions. We have to understand that this is the age of anxiety. This is the age of angst and fear. And many people, yes, they are worried about whether their children will be able to find a job. In, in two or three decades. Yes, they are worried about refugees or immigrants or about losing their, old, their, their own social fabric. As writers, we're very anxious creatures. I can never belittle someone else's anxiety. And I think it is a mistake to belittle uh, emotions. What we need to do, because we also should be talking about and focusing on what can be done from now on, we need to put more emotional intelligence on the table, I think. And for me, emotional intelligence is not the opposite of rational intelligence. It's an intersection of both. So we need to talk to people's heads and hearts at the, at the same time. Because this is not only about economy. This is not only about statistics or facts. It is very much about identity politics, about emotions and perceptions and feelings. Yeah, June. I mean, as, as always happens, it happened, uh, the best example was the American election of, I forget because I blanked it out, 2004, whenever John Kerry was the Democratic candidate, that the right has all the emotion and the left speaks in desiccated numbers and the left loses, which is kind of, the, or the liberal left is kind of partly the story of the referendum campaign. I mean, if we want to stop these populist demagogues, we have to speak the language of emotions better. That's, that's clear. Yanis, A, what do you think of that? And B, the idea that something had to give and it was this. You mean Brexit? Brexit. Absolutely. Um, look, speaking of emotions, if you really want to understand Brexit, just go and watch a Ken Loach movie. I mean, there, the, the facts and figures may help, but you really do not understand the hard economic and social reality that gives rise to a, outcomes like Brexit, like, um, you know, a good movie. Or if you really want to understand the Great Depression before you read Keynes, read John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, and if you do that, then you will understand that in uh, um, a seat somewhere in some constituency where labor used to represent people, uh, and after the years of uh, Blair and Brown, um, it made absolutely no difference whether they elected a Labour member or a Tory member to their lives. Suddenly, they had an opportunity to annoy the establishment. It's really very simple. You know, when I was standing in front of them, arguing the case for 
what I like to refer to as, and Dean refers to as the policy of constructive disobedience. In other words, lead with ideas, lead with moderate proposals of how the world could be different tomorrow morning, yeah? Not, nothing pie in the sky, and if the establishment says no, disobey, just go into a campaign of civil disobedience, or in my case, when I was a minister, governmental disobedience, say no to Schäuble, for instance. Yeah? Um, and they would look at me and they liked everything I said. But you know what? They thought in their minds, they didn't tell me because they were very nice to me, but I'm sure that this is what they thought. That's all very nice. But if we vote for Remain, nothing is going to change. Well, that was right, wasn't it? They're completely right. Because we folks, you know, we speak to audiences like this one and like the ones in Leeds and York and so on and so forth. But these people have to live with a particularly brutish and nasty insurgency that has taken over government some, years, some decades ago and treats them like fodder. And we are too useless politically as the left, as the progressives, to threaten the Tory establishment and to have any chance of being elected. And as long as we remain unelectable, uh, they will only have the opportunity of rubbing the face of the establishment uh, into some dirt by voting for Brexit. So I completely understand it. And the, as Churchill said, the demonization of uh, those who try to be agents, historical agents, by voting for Brexit is, um, is, is, is a major sinister sin on behalf of people that like to call themselves progressives. But now we're in, now we're in a situation in which our, this is a specifically British question, but maybe the last specifically British question I ask, but... Thanks, God. We have a, we have a, a party system, which is an archaic, old-fashioned party system, which is now sitting on top, arguably, of this 48-52 divide, this pro-EU, anti-EU divide. And the Labour Party, which still sits there, supposedly, as the receptacle of all our hopes, ho, 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 but there it is, uh, is conflicted about this. It's tearing itself apart, it seems. What do we do? Because it, it bugs me. We, can't, we don't want to say goodbye to the traditional working class, which sits at the heart of our politics, and yet that is perceived to sit on the 52 end of things. Our liberal instincts tell us we should be with the 48, and we end up tearing ourselves in two. Well, I think that the, the, the simple answer is twofold answer. Firstly, we should be Democrats. In other words, what does this mean? What does it translate to? Firstly, accept the referendum. We didn't like the outcome, but we have to accept Brexit now. The idea that we are going to do that which the European Union did to the Irish in 2000, when was it, 2004? When they, the Irish voted in a referendum against uh, some treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, mm -hmm. and they were asked to vote again until they got it right. But even if, even yeah? if, even if... So this... that, you know, we, we played, we lost. <laughs> but even if this government is now pursuing a vision of Brexit which it didn't present at the time but of the exactly. referendum. Exactly. So, and, and what, so what do we do next? We oppose the particular form of Brexit that Theresa May is pushing forward on the false assumption that this is what the people voted for on the 23rd of June. So what's the, what's the, the form of, in terms what's of the, the form Labour of Party? Let me just finish on this point. In terms of the Labour Party, uh, the problem with the Labour Party is that you have this incredible gap between uh, the Parliamentary Labour Party and the supporters of the Labour Party. So democracy means that every seat should be contested from scratch within the Labour Party. There should be complete deselection of everyone. But you... <laughs> but we have a new divide here. We have a new divide. The Labour MPs who represent constituencies in cities feel that they should be backing Remain. And the Labour MPs who represent, I mean, this is beyond Corbynism and all that, the Labour MPs who represent traditional post-industrial working class areas feel obliged to back leave. It's but imagine very it, what would happen if Le the Labour Party... Hold on, Party... Elif, Elif, you're nodding. Uh, uh, just very briefly. Just let, Elif, let Elif come in, I'll come back. <laughs> because uh, it's, it is, it's a pattern that's happening everywhere, not only, not only here in England. Um, in, you know, politics in a traditional sense, that too is shifting. We use these terms left and right it's also a matter of habit, but maybe it's time to notice 
The greatest divide is not between left and right anymore. We have many other divides that we need to take into picture. One of them, of course, the generation gap. Yeah. I am aware that not every young person came out to vote, but those did vote were mostly, of course, voted for Remain. There's a, there was a big generation gap, not only in this country, but also in other countries as well, we have seen the same pattern. More interestingly, I think, is the divide between the countryside and the major cities. And it is a big mistake on the part of the Brussels elite not to see this, because this has been going on for a long time. And especially in the elections in Austria, it was so visible. The entire countryside voting for a racist party, openly racist party, and the major cities with a little percentage winning, and then it was a sigh of relief for many people. I don't understand how they can see it as a sigh of relief. Big, big discrepancy between the countryside uh, and the major cities. But I think the biggest divide is between what I call tribalism. This teaching that tells us we all belong in our own tribes and that we will be safer if we are surrounded by sameness. And we should go back to that instinct, that tribalistic, isolationistic instinct. And those who oppose this and know that this could lead to a major catastrophe, that, that is where the main divide is. It's no longer in the, in the traditional left and right. Srechko, it's still January just. As we look into the new year, elsewhere in Europe, where do we look next for the next part of this story? Well, it's not only, it's not only Europe. So in Europe we will have, uh, first we will have the Dutch elections, then we will have the French elections, and then we will have the German elections. Mm. Uh, what we can see there is uh, a very worrying trend, not only on the right, uh, but also on the left. For instance, in France, you have leftists who propose the so-called Lexit uh, position, and from my opinion, they cannot defeat uh, Le Pen using the same weapon. Uh, but what worries me most is something which, is, which goes even beyond Europe. Uh, this is the geopolitical situation uh, worldwide. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, you have probably followed the news, I don't know if it was published by Guardian or Independent, or is it the same? I, I'm not sure anyway. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm sure Guardian published about it as well. I'm sure they did. Uh, last week, uh, it was for the first time in history, and I think it's a very important date, that a Chinese train directly arrived to London. I read that story in the Guardian, yes. Ah. So it's in Guardian. Uh, well, it's, it's probably written in Chinese as well already. Why is this important? It's important because this train took only 17 days through Kazakhstan, Poland, uh, reaching to other countries, to London. And what you can see, while we are talking about this, about you know, some elections in Austria, while we are talking about Trump who will change geopolitics, geopolitics already changed. And I'm really glad, can I mention BBC here? Yeah. Okay, I'm really glad that uh, you have a series, which I think is a real, authentic Leninist TV series on BBC taking place now, which is called Taboo. I'm not sure if Tom Hardy is a Leninist, but what Taboo shows is precisely what Lenin wrote in 1916 in Zurich, before starting the October Revolution, that imperialism is the high stage of capitalism. So what you can see in the series is someone who worked for the East Indian Company, and who tries, because he has a, a part of land there in, in US, which is a route to China, and he's playing a game between the Americans and between the, and between the Crown and between the East Indian Company. What you can see there is a situation which is being repeated today. Uh, it's imperialism at its end, and what Lenin claimed, of course some situation, some, some, something changed in the analysis and in the facts, but what stayed the same, what Lenin showed is the following thing. It is that when capitalism, capitalism reaches this stage, that you have countries which are so big that they, can, that they export to other countries, China coming to, to London, Trump doing erasing trade agreements and so on. What do BRICS mean today? What does G20 mean today anymore? What you can see is the highest stage of capitalism again, and to come back, I think the next consequence is war. Yeah, that's what, that's and, what that, the Lenin text says precisely that. And we don't need Lenin, Lenin for that. And you know, with, with Turkey, you can see it with the refugee crisis. For me, the Syrian conflict and the refugee crisis cannot be solved. 
it cannot be solved because too many geopolitical players are involved, from Saudi Arabia to Russia to the French to the UK. And it was precisely the European countries who first created the war in Libya, then the arms went to Syria. Follow WikiLeaks, you can see this information pretty clearly. And what is happening now, then as a boomerang, the refugee crisis comes back to, to Europe. Okay. Mikhail Gorbachev said this week, didn't he, that as far as he could tell, it looked like the world was preparing for war. Is he still alive? He is. <laughs> he may be in the audience. Um, well, I know Kissinger is alive. He was on the guest list. Um, Yanis, yes. where are we going? What happens next? I'd prefer to talk about what should happen. You know, tell me, well, tell uh, me, prophecy tell me, where, not tell my me where, we, where we are going, and by contrast, where we could be going. Can you, well, can you juxtapose? I'll, two okay, I'll, no, I'll answer your question. I don't like answering it, but I shall. In, in terms of, 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 the, of the global scene, yeah. my great fear is that Trump will be successful for about a year. Uh, his um, New Deal kind of economic policy of boosting infrastructure spending and uh, uh, supporting minimum wages. You know, the first people that he saw after he became president was the trades union leaders. I wrote about this only this morning. Yeah? Yeah. I spoke Guardian. to one of them. Yeah. And he was actually <laughs> overwhelmed by the positive attitude of Trump to the trades unions. So, yeah, which is, of course, what Mussolini did immediately after he took power in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, he co-opted the working class. He created minimum wages, social security, yeah. uh, on condition, of course, that the working class would be completely acquiescent to capital, yeah. to monopoly, mon monopoly capital, and that they would form a coalition with the, the, the ruling class against everyone else, <laughs> the, the imperialistic part. Now, so my, my fear is that, you know, it, it, the federal budget of the United States, allow me to speak as an economist very briefly, uh, is underfunded because of Reagan and Bush tax cuts. Uh, let me put it this way, over the last 30 years, every dollar the American government pays on infrastructure and on research and development, and that's a lot of money, uh, is funded by deficits, by debt. Um, I don't have a problem with deficit spending, but they are overdoing it there. And the idea now is that he's going to do two things, increase spending substantially, while giving huge tax cuts to himself and to his mates. So that is going to balloon the deficit. It will create an irrational exuberance. You can already see that Wall Street is going through the roof. Uh, while at the very same time, starting a trade war against China and pushing the Chinese to do that which Reagan pushed Japan to do in 1985, to boost the value of the currency, at the time when the Chinese currency should be coming down, not going up. If he succeeds in this even 20, 30% of the way, this is, we, we are running a very serious risk of the credit bubble in China bursting. And when that happens, global economic activity is going to be reduced. And the Chinese are going to start selling a lot of the American federal debt, U.S. Treasury bills that they own, because they will be impecunious. So it will be the perfect storm in the United States. The deficit will be going up because of tax cuts and infrastructural spending. Interest rates will be going up, and then they will go much further up because the Chinese will be selling, dumping their uh, American bonds. And this will be approximately before the midterm elections there. Trump will panic. They will, he will slam the brakes of the economy, and we will go into another huge uh, recession, starting from the United States. And then I ask you this, and this is a rhetorical question, you can answer it if you want. What do you think the reaction will be of all those people who believed in him, that he was going to revive their life prospects? What will the reaction be in Doncaster, since we were talking about Doncaster, what will the reaction be when in Germany many of the people with many jobs, the working poor in, the, in Germany, become unemployed poor? It is not a very rosy picture. It isn't, but as you said earlier, the centre-left, the left arguably, in most advanced economies, is in a pretty confused state. Modernity confuses it. it oh, there is no such thing as the centre-left so, anymore. So, so, in a situation... There is no centre-left. 
Uh, where is, where, where is this? But is I'm it? I'm told land? they're doing all right in Portugal. It's gone. Anyway, um, I think they are doing all right in Portugal. Anyway, in Portugal, in Portugal. they're doing all right they're in the sense right that in they were voted in. They have a very fragile coalition. But you know what is the tragic thing about the Portuguese government? That they had to, de to do that which, which Tsipras did six months afterwards. They did it before they got elected. In other words, they surrendered before allowed to form a government. Okay, before we go down a, a Portuguese rabbit hole, hold on, which I don't <laughs> particularly want to do. Uh, what, what's the, what will be the politics of the point at which those voters who have voted for these populist, so called populist options, in the expectation that it might materially improve their lives, in the absence of a viable left or centre left, what happens then? But Something again, to the right of again, Trump and Farah. I think Turkey could be a good example for that. Okay. Because I was going to ask you about it, Turkey. We've seen conflict. it over the years, uh, lots of crises, lots of problems, but that did not necessarily decrease their electoral base. It did just the opposite, strengthen it and polarize it. Because the way many, especially in Turkey, the, 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 the way the populism, the mechanics of populism works is by dividing the society, pitting half of the society against the other half. Right. And that very much works in their favor. The second dangerous thing is, and history is full of examples of that, the longer they stay in power, the more they benefit from, from controlling the apparatuses of the, of the state. So they, they are strengthened over time. And the third thing is if you can create enemies, imaginary or real enemies That's inside right. and outside, that will also bolster your position. So even if there's an economic crisis, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that will undermine no, I agree his, entirely. his electoral basis. So that's Trump why will double down. It will, he will even turn double, into yeah. more authoritarian. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the question. But, so but the, whole, the, question. the whole th yeah. thing is going to become uh, more uh, reliant on fascistic methods. Yeah. for reproducing itself, but to the extent unless that has, the, we have a progressive extent, international response. Yeah. To the extent that um, history and politics is always replete with irony, that his own failure will create more fertile conditions for his kind of politics. Correct. Of course. Not only there, but in other countries Correct. as well. Okay, and in, the connected. and in the Turkish example, you've said this before, the worse it gets in Europe, the more Erdogan takes encouragement from that. And the same applies to Trump. Yes, the same applies. There are so many of them now. We have Putin, we have Modi, we have, you know, in the Philippines, one after another, the same models repeating itself. And the one area that we haven't talked about yet is the Middle East. I mean, if we're talking about the future, so much is changing there, including national ethnic boundaries, or at least there's a perception that it could change, which could only mean bloodshed. Um, the refugee crisis, the entire model is not sustainable. So the crisis in one country only affects further crisis in, in, in other countries. <coughs> we have, in a way, uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the elite in Brussels try to outsource the refugee crisis. And we have three countries, Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. In Turkey, three million refugees. The model is not sustainable, it's, it's impossible. And the King of Jordan, he openly, more and more, he says, we can't you know, continue like this anymore. So there's also the Middle East that we need to uh, put on the table. We have the 50th anniversary of the, of the Six Day War. Uh, lots of conflicts coming from, from the Middle East, which is also going to trigger further far right uh, across Europe. Okay. Um, before we conclude this very optimistic section of the evening, um, <laughs> Shrechko, I just want to ask you one, very, one last very optimistic question. Is it inevitable the, the, that the EU as we know it will collapse? Not necessarily. I mean, that's the reason why we founded something what is called Diem, and we, we invite you all tomorrow to Convey Hall. Uh, not only Brian Eno will join us, which you didn't mention. In the oh, yes. Yeah. You did? I didn't mention it. Uh, yeah, but also I just, many activists. I was just reminded. So what we are trying to do in Diem is you know, not only to have uh, discussions such as this one, uh, but really to work on the horizontal level. And I don't think it's finished. This year I traveled from Nuit de in France uh, to Spain, only in Catalonia you have 600 cooperatives. They even invented a digital currency called ECO, which means that inside of this system they created an alternative system. So even if the European Union collapses, there is the possibility to create a different kind of Europe. I, I chose my words reasonably carefully when I asked you that question. I said yep. the European Union as we know it. Now, uh, federations of countries, partnerships between countries of, a, of any kind, if they, uh, if they decline, if they, if they hit choppy water, 
they don't tend to seamlessly reinvent themselves. You get periods of turbulence and crisis, right? So is that part of it inevitable? I don't think anything is inevitable. How do you pronounce it? Inevitable. <laughs> I'm a savage from the Balkans, sorry. <laughs> it, well, is it going to get worse before it gets better? Well, I think in the end everything will be okay. If it's not okay, then it's not the end. <laughs> No, let me, let me just be very concrete, the jokes aside. We should all go home now. Excuse me? That's it. We've ended at the correct place. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, know, it, I didn't it, think it, you were going to say that. Having it, read your material over the last week, I did not think you were going to say everything's going to be okay. So. But I added something. If it's not okay, it's still not the end. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what I said. No, uh, also there is another anniversary I think it's important to say, which is coming this year, is the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution. Uh, and, well, I'm not a hardcore Bolshevik or something like that, but I think it's a very important uh, uh, revolution which shows that also out of a crisis, out of a bloody war, there is also a possibility for something else. And I think also out of the crisis of the European Union, there is a possibility for something better. And also, I mean, I know it's not popular, I know people are hostile towards our comrade Slavoj Žižek, who is also part of the, I mean, almost everyone is. Uh, uh, he said that Trump actually creates an opportunity. And I agree with that in the sense that if Hillary Clinton was in power, we wouldn't have this discussion. If Brexit didn't happen, I'm not glad that it happened, we wouldn't have this discussion. It was, and it still is, a big awakening and a chance for all the progressives, and not only left, I think it's a chance for the left, for the liberals, for the social democrats, to come together and to build something which didn't exist in the 1930s, which is the reason why the Second World War happened. Elif, just briefly before I go into the questions that we've been sent, uh, to what extent do you share that vision of things? That even in this darkest hour there are glimmers of light, or are there days when it's hard to see those glimmers? You know, there's something that, that, that worries me. Populism creates its own myths, and the biggest, the core myth that it creates is this antagonistic society, antagonistic image of society, the people versus the corrupt elite. Yeah, it's a pattern, it keeps repeating again and again. And I'm worried that we are buying that argument without even being aware of it. Uh, you will remember after Brexit, one of the very first things that Farage said was to say, you see the real people, the decent people, the ordinary people in Britain have made their choice. What does that mean? There's real people and there's also unreal people, yeah. you know, something else. These dualities, I, I really think we should be very careful because populists benefit from these dualities. I do not think that Trump's I know Zizek says similar things, but I find it very problematic that it's good that Trump came to power because the revolution will come sooner. I, I, I didn't I, say it's good, didn't but say I think, that. Yeah. No, but he said similar things, and I find it very problematic, that kind of approach. There's another uh, thing you just mentioned, which I find very interesting as well, which is uh, it's become a cliche in a, in a matter of weeks, actually, this idea that the left should be populist, that the left should start, come up with its own conception of real people, hmm. and it should declare war on elites and so on. Well, there, are, there, are, there are YouTube videos uh, I've seen recently uh, aiming to uh, use a populist approach. There was one about rail privatisation, mm. which made out, I don't know whether you saw this, that made out that uh, people in continental Europe or ordinary Germans and Dutch people and so on were stuffing their pockets with the proceeds of rail privatisation. Yeah. And yeah. this was used as a left-wing argument, right? There's a danger there, isn't there? there? There is a danger, but we should not fall into their trap. We have to see that they are also part of the elite. Today it's populist leaders. They are also the elite, the establishment, just another part of the establishment with a different ideology. So Marine Le Pen, she's not part of the political establishment, seriously? Trump is not part of the, the establishment, is that possible? This is the myth they're creating. For me, one thing is very clear. They keep encouraging each other, you know, breeding each other. It's not a, it's not a coincidence that this summit happened between uh, populist leaders from the Netherlands, from Germany, from France. Uh, it's, it's not a coincidence. And with the hashtag, now they're saying we're going to make our countries great again. So I agree with you. This is, a, this is the moment for us to wake up. They said it was a moment for them to wake up, but it's for us a moment to wake up. If I may add this, there's a, there's a beautiful expression by the Lebanese 
poet and, and thinker, Khalid Gibran, he says in, in one of his books, he mentions how he learned silence from the talkative and how he learned kindness from the unkind and how he learned tolerance from the intolerant. I think that should be our motto at this moment in history. We have to learn the indispensability of democracy from populists. We have to learn the beauty of diversity from xenophobes. And we have to learn the urgency of international cooperation from the nationalists. So whatever they're saying, we're going to do exactly the opposite. Yanis, just quickly before I, before I go to these questions. Elif just mentioned that picture we've all seen this week of uh, Le Pen and Geert Wilders and various other populist leaders. Now, I think it's you, you use the term the nationalist international for these people. How much do they worry you and to what extent do you think they are going to kind of make the political weather in the next year? Oh, I'm terrified of them. And they're thoroughly nasty people. And they're getting stronger because of the spectacular failures of the elites and the establishment. So you have this combination of authoritarianism and failed policies by the establishment uh, creating terrible outcomes. You have a left which is not there to provide a vision. The left does not need to be populist. The left cannot be populist. The moment the left becomes populist, it's not left. The left must become popular on the basis of speaking uh, truth to power and truth to everyone. Uh, the, I want to um, emphasize something that Elif said very correctly. It is a mistake to believe that there is an almighty political clash between the establishment and the populists. I think of them as accomplices. They need each other. Sure. Le Pen thrives on the failures of Brussels. Farage would not have existed without the inane handling of Europe's inevitable crisis. And at the same time, the establishment needs Le Pen. Because what is the only argument today for voting for somebody like Fillon, for God's sakes? <laughs> Vote for him, otherwise Le Pen will come in. So they need each other. <laughs> They're accomplices. And the, 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 the right way of, of thinking of the historical clash which is shaping the future as we speak is not between Le Pen and Fillon, not between Farage and UKIP on the one hand and the Tories on the other, uh, or the official Remain campaign against the official Brexit campaign. The, the, the historical contradiction which is going to spawn the future and which we must influence in order to bring about a better future rather than a bleak one is between these two accomplices on the one hand and an emergent progressive international that will oppose simultaneously the nationalist international and the failing globalized establishment. Right, I'm going to go through these questions. Chip in as you see fit. If you keep the answers relatively clipped, we'll get through them. There are seven or eight. Uh, Sarah Franklin sent in this question. It's a good question. Given that the Leave vote was a reaction, in part, to the widening and obvious gap between the very wealthy and the rest of us, do you think a post-Brexit economy, in other words, the economy of the UK outside the EU, possibly without Scotland, can redress this extreme inequality that has evolved over the past 40 years. Can the UK do that post-Brexit? It's highly unlikely. It is not impossible, depending on which government you have. But Brexit, unfortunately, has toxic effects both on the politics of the European Union in, on the continent and on the politics of Britain. It's turning this place into a nastier place, not to a better place, because of the way the narrative is progressing. Uh, Sreczko, you mentioned the Russian Revolution before. There is among portions, parts of the left, I think now, some idea of socialism in one country, to use Joe Stalin's phrase. Always a good person to take phrases from. Um, <laughs> no, you are becoming any... Zizek. <laughs> Zizek likes to do that, yeah. Is there, uh, is there any mileage in that idea, do you think? No, that I, somehow this is a 
platform for socialism? Well, we could have seen it in Greece uh, when during uh, the period when Yanis was the finance minister, there were ones who claimed that it's possible and it's necessary to exit uh, the Eurozone in order to achieve a better society in Greece. You could have seen it with the exit position in Britain. And well, it reminds me really on the old discussion about the possibility of socialism in one country. I don't think it's possible because uh, although Britain looks like an island, Britain is not an island. We are all part of global capitalism and global capitalism is everywhere and you cannot exit global capitalism. Even if you are living in a commune somewhere in Spain, you are still part of global capitalism. Imagine only that, for instance, the sea level rises for one meter, you will instantly have three million people from Bangladesh who will come to Europe. So even if you live in a commune, even if you're outside, even if, if you have socialism in one country, it will have effects on your country and on your commune. But Yanis said earlier that we have yep. to accept Brexit. So, if, uh, so how do we marry those two things together? If, if there is very little chance of creating a more equal society post-Brexit and yet we have to accept it. Very briefly, my line would be, if I were a British politician, I'm not, Thank God for this, <laughs> both for Britain and for me. But if I were in, in the Labour Party, for instance, my line would be, uh, Brexit was voted for, so we have to accept it, but no one delivered the verdict on the single market, on free movement, mm -hmm. on maintaining the human rights mm -hmm. standards of the European Union. Uh, and let's have the following. Let's activate Article 50, because this is what the people wanted us to do, that takes two years and negotiate in the meantime an interim agreement of about five to seven years of a Norway kind solution which respects Brexit on the one hand but minimizes changes on the other and let the next House of Commons decide and deliberate and debate what form of uh, arrangements we want with the European Union after that. That is a democratic response to a Brexit outcome that I didn't want. That answers the, <laughs> the next question. That answers the next question. <laughs> You're obviously clairvoyant because uh, Alexei Demond uh, sent in a question which you've just answered. It seems, just to put, make it clear that we have tackled this question, it seems Britain is headed for a disastrous hard Brexit. <laughs> if this is the case, surely uh, DM25 and Jeremy Corbyn must oppose the activation of Article 50. How can that be done without being portrayed as anti-democratic? You have just answered that question. Uh, Elif, this, is a, 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 this chimes with something you said earlier on. Robin Stafford emailed in a question. In a post-truth, evidence-free, emotive world, mm -hmm. how should the opposition change their approach and methods? The answer is lie as well, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> there must be a more elegant version. Oh, well, but it's such an important question. I mean, now we're talking about alternative facts and, and this... Um, the arrogance that comes with it. I'm, I'm sure you have seen... Uh, Trump's exchange with, 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 with the American media when he claimed that millions of voters had voted illegally and so many media outlets came forward and said, but that's not true, there are no facts supporting this. And he tweeted back saying, then you prove that it's a lie. So this method, what well, everything is topsy-turvy, you know, you just fabricate a lie and then, well, prove it. If you can't prove it, then I'm not lying. It's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Um, and certainly we have to have our facts straight. Certainly we should remind people of facts and, and, and the truth and knowledge. Knowledge is incredibly important. What I am worried about, and we've seen uh, signs of this in Turkey as well, politicians coming forward and saying to the people, you see, the experts got it wrong each time and you do not need them. You do not need their knowledge. You only rely on your gut feeling, that's enough. So we have this anti-knowledge movement that goes hand in hand with populism. And I find that very dangerous as well. We have to understand that they're not the same thing. Information is not the same thing as knowledge. Knowledge is not the same as wisdom. We have a lot of information about anything and everything. That's why some scholars call it the pancake generation. Like when you're making a pancake, you know, it diffuses everywhere along the pan, but it's quite thin, isn't it? It doesn't go deep. It's not nuanced. But we have a little bit of information about everything. That doesn't mean we have the knowledge, and that doesn't mean we have the, the wisdom either, which is something else altogether. 
together and requires emotional intelligence. So what I'm trying to say is we have to remind people and ourselves of the importance of knowledge because one of the basic tenets of populism is to undermine the importance of knowledge, to undermine the importance of truth and facts. We will be saying, no, these things are important and at the same time talk about emotions and feelings and perceptions. To me, the opposite of hatred, they have a lot of hatred and I agree it's very toxic, but the opposite of hatred is, is, is indifference, you know? is numbness, when we become numb, when we become passive, when we think that we can't do anything, when we can't change anything, then they will benefit from that numbness. Um. <laughs> there is a question here from Eva Olla about immigration. Immigrants, she says, have become the main focus of Brexit. She says she'd be interested to know the panel's views on immigration and its influence on the UK. To sort of develop that question, uh, it's something I've encountered a lot in my reporting. I meet people regularly who voted leave, who are very anxious and often very angry about immigration, and they see immigration as something which will make scarce opportunities even scarcer, and overstretched public services even more overstretched, and housing even harder to come by. <laughs> And sometimes when you visit those communities, it's quite difficult to argue with where they're coming from, which is a very, very difficult conclusion to go anywhere near. It's very uncomfortable. What do we do about that? Because clearly it's antithetical to all the liberal values that we've talked about, and yet it's probably the single biggest political thing which sits at the heart of what we've been talking about. So let's go first. Well, I have to uh, refer to something what Elif already said said, look at Lebanon. Lebanon has 40%, 40% of the population are refugees, which is 1.5 million, which is the population of the country where I come from, Croatia, or Denmark, for instance. They have a refugee problem. Europe, 1 million refugees, it's, it's nothing. Also, another thing what I would add, look at the jobs, what the immigrants do in London. It is the jobs when you go to the subway, you will see all the bullshit jobs. So I think people shouldn't be scared for those people. They're actually doing the jobs normal or decent English people don't want to do. So in that sense, even if you just take the numbers, people shouldn't be scared about it. But they are, but they are, Yanis, they are right? No, I can understand. They have every course. reason to be. Okay, hold on, that's, a, that's interesting. I, Go on, they have every reason. They have every reason to be. But the analysis is wrong. If you think about it, why do we have uh, pressure on housing in English towns. It's not because of migrants. Migrants highlight it and therefore become the focal point of anxiety. The reason is because Mrs. Thatcher sold off the council houses. <laughs> and because I was reading in, in, in The Guardian that even labor councils in London are privatizing. They really are, yeah. Huh? And they are creating new estates that are privately owned Absolutely. in order to push out everyone. So this is the problem. The problem is austerity. And when you have austerity, which is universal, you have these two effects. On the one hand, you have, you know, I'll mention Doncaster once more, because there was a story about that. There was a fantastic old lady who walked up to me and he, she said to me what you're saying. She said to me, look, I support you, I agree with you, but you know what? In my block of flats, there are these four Romanian boys that live next to me. They're lovely boys. She was not racist, she was not xenophobic, she actually liked them. But she said, you know, they do all sorts of jobs, they don't have families, their families are back in Romania. They earn, all four of them, a bundle of, 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 of pounds. They can afford a much higher rate, rent, than a, a normal uh, Doncaster family can. So they're bidding the, the rent up. Most of the money that they make, they do not spend in the local community because they send it back home. And she understood why. And we can't go on like this. Now, the answer to this is twofold, you'll allow me to say. Firstly, more social housing in Doncaster. And secondly, let's have freedom of movement bilateral or multilateral agreements on freedom of movement predicated upon the condition 
that the Romanian government must provide Romanian people in their com communities with a living wage if they want to have the right for their citizens to migrate to Britain. Right. That's right. Okay. This question's about emotional intelligence as much as it's about anything, isn't it? I think it's about culture as well. I mean, so many of these clashes and perceptions revolve around culture and, and the fear of losing a national identity. And, and I can understand that. It's a bit, you know, when we, spoke, when we speak about globalization, I think it brought out the best in us and it brought us out the worst in us at the same time, simultaneously. The same with you know, all the problems that we're talking about. We need to have a more nuanced approach. So definitely, on the one hand, we need to uphold the liberal values, but on the other hand, understand people's worries when it comes to losing their culture. We might not agree, but understand. Another thing that we do not talk about much is the gender, gender imbalance. Because the, the journey from uh, particularly Syria, but not only from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Iraq as well, into the shores of Europe, towards the shores of Europe, is such a dangerous journey. Most of the immigrants who could make this journey were young men. In some places like Sweden, this affected even gender ratios in small towns, and it created yeah. further clashes. We've seen this in Germany as well. So we need to talk about these other aspects, cultural aspects, gender aspects, I've never understood why the Brussels elite, again, have been so blind not to be more welcoming towards, for instance, sexual minorities coming from Syria, women coming from you know, Syria, empowering them more. There is a huge mess at the moment, and I agree it's not uh, sustainable a a at all uh, under, under this model. We're getting very can, near the end. Can, can I add one Just one, quickly, because then, I will, then I, I, I'm moving towards this note of optimism that I've been thinking inwardly okay. about for an hour. <laughs> um, go on, quickly. Yeah, well, just one story. Yeah. <laughs> because, because, because Elif was talking about the, uh, the way in which the European Union has completely uh, violated every humanitarian uh, canon that one can imagine of. Well, I mean, we are in the church, so let me tell you a story about a, some, a, that has a Christian dimension. His name is Shabir. He comes from Pakistan. His great move that completely wrecked his life was to come to the aid of his neighbor. His neighbor was a Christian, a Christian family in a town in Pakistan. The Islamists petrol bombed the house of the Christians in the middle of the night, and Shabir, who is a Muslim, went out and helped that family. The next day, he was branded an apostate for having helped the Christian family. His brother was killed. He was a businessman. He had a rent-a-car business. His cars were burned down. And then he had, in order to divert the attention of the Islamic fundamentalists away from his family, he took his elderly father and walked across Iran into Turkey. In Turkey, he was at attacked by uh, robbers. His father died. He carried his father's corpse in his, in his arms. Policemen attacked him. He managed to escape to cut a very long story, an odyssey short. He ends up on a boat from the Turkish coast to Lesbos. Yeah. The boat sinks. There were 70 people on board. 35 died. He managed to just about survive, to escape with his life. He ends up in Mytilene in Lesbos, and he applies for asylum. This person whose life was wrecked because he tried to help a Christian neighbor. And what does Christian Europe do? In the context of the EU-Turkey treaty, he is now awaiting extradition back to Turkey. Now, you only have to tell the story in order to capture the horrors that is the European Union uh, Turkey deal and this humanita humanitarian refugee crisis. The last question is about what we, that is the people here and people who are going to watch this when it's uh, turned very quickly into a Guardian video and podcast and all of that, what we can do. DM25 has a fairly or a very clear agenda, which is first of all, in the short term, to make the EU transparent to hugely heighten its accountability, mm -hmm. then to uh, convene a, an assembly which will, then, which will consider how to make the EU genuinely democratic. And I'm right in saying by 2025 yes. to begin to move towards exactly that point. Now, 
I don't think you missed. Th I don't think there's anybody. A lot in between. I know. I'm running out of time. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody here who would have any problem with that. The first question is: We're British, and we've just left, uh, despite uh, some of our better efforts. Are we invited? Can we participate? Of and, course. And secondly, think what about do we, it. And what do we do? You haven't left. You're trying to leave. <laughs> Don't get confused. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the Hotel California line. You can check yeah, out. Yeah, you can't really. leave. <laughs> it will take years to leave. Now, how about? Wouldn't you like, as citizens of this great nation, the negotiations between your government and the European Union to be transparent, so that you know what they are talking about on your behalf? Yeah. How about that? That would be a start. Stretchko, what can we do? Well, I think if the Sex Pistols play it in Convey Hall, you can all come for free to Convey Hall tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, to increase the enticing nature of that offer, what's gonna, what are you going to be talking about in terms of actual practical action? People it will be take? just to say, and it's important, unlike this completely undemocratic uh, uh, event, let me be a bit self-critical as well, where all the all the questions were planned in advance and so on, and probably went. At... I'm joking, of course. Uh, I'm really joking. You were a great moderator, and thank you. You're very kind. Uh, but unlike today, tomorrow in Conway Hall, we will have a horizontal discussion without big speeches. It will be a democratic deliberation where everyone can come and invent and invest into DM and in our common future. Elif, what can we do? I think there's so, a lot we need, that we need to do, but uh, the first thing is to refrain from passivity or, or despair. I, I, I'm, I've always been a big believer in, in, in Gramsci's motto. It's, it's good to be half pessimistic, you know, the pessimism of the intellect, which will make us more realistic and urge us into action, but at the same time, optimism of the will, because when you look at human beings, when you talk to people, the young people, minorities, women, then you can also see there's a lot of hope there. What can we do? We need, to, we need to travel, we need to talk to people from completely diverse backgrounds, get out of big cities, get out of our own echo chambers, you know, connect, and, and to understand that whether we like it or not, we are all interconnected, our destinies are connected. So um, DM is very important because it, it, it sees Europe not, not only looking at uh, the political boundaries of Europe, you know, Europe in the, in the broader sense, maybe going back to broader Europe, including the Mediterranean, uh, and, and reminding us that we, because the, the biggest challenges that we are facing today are international problems, there's no way we can solve them unless we do it through international cooperation. Yanis, you have 30 seconds. Tell us to send people home feeling better about the world. Why? why we still should think of ourselves as Europeans and the kind of society and the kind of world that when we do so in this way that Diem proposes, we can set our sights on. It's just exactly what I said at the beginning. Think of the problems that you're facing in exactly the same way that you're thinking of climate change. Either we're going to be efficient in the way we attack them or not. As for what Diem is trying to do tomorrow and generally, we're trying to bring together progressives in Britain because progressives in Britain are so divided. It is, this sectarianism Everywhere. of the British political scene is mind-boggling. Yeah. You know, you have the, 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 Corbyn's Labour Party not talking to Caroline Lucas because she doesn't belong to Labour and if they talk to her then the Blairites are going to attack them even more fiercely. You have the SNP being treated by Labour as the enemy. In, uh, you have Plaid Company. I mean, it's, 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 we've had enough of this. It's about time we stop recoiling behind our principles. Every general election, losing it. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, and you I know, Trump oh. gives us some hope, doesn't he? <laughs> Does he? Yes, you know what? That's an I mean, he's a despicable creature. There's nothing good about his election, except that he proved that we leftists have been profoundly wrong all our lives when we have been hiding behind the idea that the establishment is too strong and we cannot defeat it. He ganged up on his own with a few idiots against the establishment and he won. If he can do it, we can do it. <laughs> On that note, at 9.32, uh, books by these three people uh, are available in the foyer. I suggest you buy as many as you can, and I mean that 
sincerely. That was probably the most rich, inspiring, nuanced conversation I've had since the referendum. I'd like you to join me in thanking Yanis Varoufakis, Elif Shafak and Sretsko Horak. <laughs>